This Bible study is going to be on Daniel's vision of the last evil kingdom. I call it Satan's Iron Kingdom. All right, get your King James Bibles. And let's go to Jeremiah chapter 28 and verse 14. This is going to be a very controversial study, not so much because of the iron itself, but uh, the background leading up to the iron. Because sadly, most people have such a elementary knowledge of the Bible, if at all. I mean, I know most people, they've never even bothered to read the entire Bible. And then they want to tell you what the Bible says. And they've there's like whole books that they've never even bothered to read. But they'll be happy to tell you, oh, well, that's not true. I don't believe that. Well, you know, thing is, if you've never read the Bible from cover to cover, how do you know what's in it? I mean, just because God says he loves the world, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life, John 3, 16. That same God, Nobadiah 1, said, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. Is Esau part of the world? Evidently. Most people have no idea why God hated Esau. No idea at all. Well, Esau was wicked. We're all wicked. So, turn to Jeremiah chapter 28, verse 14. Now, Jeremiah was not a popular prophet. He came to Jerusalem and told everybody, God's going to punish you people for your wickedness. And they're like, oh no, God would never do that. We're the chosen people. No way, dude. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have put a yoke of iron upon the neck of all these nations, that they may serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and they shall serve him, and I have given him the beasts of the field also. Jeremiah pronounced that God was going to put a yoke of iron. If you don't know what a yoke is, they would put a yoke like a harness on the necks of plow animals, like an oxen, or horses, so that they could pull the plow through the, the field. That's what a yoke was. It was a burden. It wasn't something that no, nobody wants a yoke. And he says he was going to put a yoke of iron. Why iron? Iron is very hard to break, and it's heavy. I mean, come on, people. Uh, any of the ladies that has a cast iron skillet knows they're heavy. Okay, and they're 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 hard. I mean, it's you know it's you know it's not like wood. You could break wood. Iron's not that easy to break. Iron's tough. Now, let's do a little bit of background. Iron is a Latin word, and its uh, original root is ferrum, and we, that's where they, have you ever heard of a ferrous metal, F-E-R-R-O-U-S, I believe I'm spelling that right, but that's where it comes from. Ferrous has reference to having iron in it. Now, The thing is, iron is, it's a metal, 
and according to the dictionary, it's the hardest, most common, and most useful of all the metals as an element, okay, of a livid whitish color, inclined to gray, internally comp composed to appear of small facets and susceptible to a fine polish. Okay, it is so hard and elastic as to be capable of destroying the aggregations of any other metal. Okay, in other words, it's hard, but yet it bends. That's what it means to be elastic. It bends. Glass, believe it or not, is structurally as strong as steel, but once it reaches the point where it starts to bend, it doesn't bend, it just shatters. It cracks. Whereas iron, you know, uh, go to an old car that's got an iron fender and hit it with a hammer. It doesn't shatter. It, it'll, it'll bend, right? But if you try to sharpen iron with a softer metal, it's not going to work. So, uh, let's see. Next to tin, it is the lightest of all metallic substances. And, uh, in other words, lead is heavier than iron. So, let's see. It could be hammered into plates, but not into leaves. It has the property of magnetism. It is attracted by lodestone, which is, you know, magnetic. And will acquire its properties... In other words, if you take a magnetic stone and rub the iron with it, the iron will turn magnetic. It is rarely found in native masses, but in ores, mineralized by different substances. In other words, it's mixed with everything else. It abounds in every part of the earth. Its medicinal qualities are valuable. Okay, so that's basically uh, what iron is. And if you take iron and you mix it with carbon, you get what's called steel. Now, a lot of people don't know it, but if you take iron and you leave it outside in the air, it, it rusts. That's called ferrous oxide. It's red, right? Well, what's your blood? Your blood's red. You know why? Iron. The iron in your blood carries oxygen to all the tissue and cells in your body, without which you die. So iron is a very important thing. So I gave you a little bit of background about what iron is. And I'm not a metallurgist, so I'm not an expert. I'm just reading from the dictionary and what I learned in science class in college all through the years. Let's go to Daniel, chapter 2. All right, so we had our little history lesson. Jeremiah pronounced that uh, Judah and Jerusalem were going to go into captivity for their wickedness, and they were going to go into Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. Well, Daniel was a prince of Judah. So, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream in Daniel chapter 2, and nobody can interpret it. So, the Lord gives Daniel the interpretation. So, let's read Daniel's interpretation of what King Nebuchadnezzar read. You know, I, I haven't even hardly started this study, and it's almost 10 minutes. Uh, I could do probably a two or three hour study on this. And we're just getting started. I mean, you know, but I try to be thorough so that there's no doubt. All right, the book of Daniel. Daniel's going to explain to Nebuchadnezzar the king the dream that he had. Thou, O king, sawest and behold a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine 
gold. His breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. Now, in my uh, mountains Bible study, I interpret who this stone is. The stone's Christ, people. I mean, without a doubt, when you go through uh, the mountain series, you will find out that this stone that was cut out without hands, that smote the image, that fills the earth, is going to be Christ and his kingdom. Because he's the stone that the builders rejected. Okay? Uh, let's see. Verse 33 again. His legs of iron, his feet, part of iron, and part of clay. Now this is prophetic, okay? Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet, that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Mountains oftentimes represents governments in the Bible. Think about that when you read about, like, Mystery Babylon. And it says uh, the woman sits, the whore, you know, the whore that sits on, you know, sits on seven hills. Well... Seven hills, seven mountains. Think about it. But that's why I did the mountain study. And I explained this, this, this stone that fills the whole earth is Christ in his kingdom. All right, verse 36. This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. So now Daniel told him the dream. Now he's going to interpret it. Verse 37, Thou, O king, art a king of kings. Isn't Jesus called king of king and lord of lords? Oh, yeah. You see, God gave Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar this kingdom. I mean, Jeremiah told Jerusalem and Judah, Oh, you guys are going into captivity with uh, Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar. Oh, yeah, you're going as punishment for your wickedness. It's God that gives kingdoms to people and God that takes kingdoms away from people. All right. This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings. For the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom. For the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven, hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. Now, it's interesting when you read the Bible, um, gold, when you read about the vessels or the furniture in the tabernacle in the, in the temple. Uh, gold was to be associated with God. Now, I'm not saying Nebuchadnezzar's God, but he's the head and he had a head of gold. Who gave him his kingdom? The Lord did. Okay. So thou art this head of gold. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee. Remember, it was gold, and then silver, and then brass, and then iron, and then iron and clay. Well, gold is much more valuable than silver. Silver is valuable, but it's not as valuable as gold. Okay. Thou art this head of gold, and after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron. So we're talking about the fourth 
kingdom. Satan's kingdom, right? And you've got a, a million different interpretations. You got some people say, oh, well, that's Rome, and others will say, oh, it's the United States, and then others will say it's Mo the uh, Islam's in Me Mecca, and then others say, well, you know, it's Jerusalem and the kingdom of the Zionists and the Antichrist. You know, when it comes, we'll know what it is. So, I've even had some people say it's going to be uh, London, England. I don't know. We'll find out, won't we? And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things. And as iron that breaketh all these shall, shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of iron, forasmuch as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. Now, what happens when you take clay and you bake it, you have pottery. What happens when you drop pottery on a stone? It breaks. Or if you hit it with uh, an iron rod or a bar, it's going to break. But it has a certain amount of strength. But it's not real strong. So the kingdom is going to be partly strong, partly broken. Uh, let's see. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they, here's the interpretation, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. What? Iron and clay? They? They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men? Pay attention to that, people. This is, t this is very telling. Now think about it. What was, what was Adam taken out of? Wasn't he taken out of the, out of the earth? Clay? Was, was Adam taken out of clay? You know, in Georgia, uh, the clay is red because of the iron. I've been there. I've seen it. Red bricks, iron. Iron's mixed with the clay. And uh, when you bake it, it gets strong and hard. So, but, uh, you know, it's something to think about. So, and whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they... They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. How does iron and clay mingle themselves with the seed of men? Do you know what mingle means? It means to mix. How do they mix themselves or mingle themselves with the seed of men? How does iron and clay mix themselves with the seed of men? Unless, of course, these, this is a figure of speech. And if it is a figure of speech, we got to go and find out in reference what it is. The interpretation. The Bible, the King James Bible always interprets the King James Bible. All right. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in these days, and in the days of these kings, kings, not the king, but kings, there's going to be multiple kings. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. But it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. And it shall stand 
forever. The stone that smites the image and becomes a great mountain that fills the whole earth, that's going to be Christ's kingdom that fills the whole earth and it's going to last forever. How long is forever? Forever. And, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain and the interpretation thereof sure. So, Daniel gives the king the dream, and then he interprets it. God gives Daniel the interpretation of the dream. All right, so what does Nebuchadnezzar do in Daniel chapter 3? Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. Isn't that funny? Three score, that's um, 60, and the breadth was six. So it was 60 and six, right? He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And then, you know, he sets up this image. He gets full of pride and he sets up this image. And then uh, if you've read the story about the uh, three Hebrew children that refused to bow down to the image, they were thrown into the furnace, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Well, this is it. So I'm not going to keep reading this because, you know, I've already done over 20 minutes and I've barely scratched the surface. I'm hoping I'll be able to do this in a, within two hours or so. But this is going to be an important Bible study. It really is. And I'm kind of learning as I go, because I've got an idea of where this is going. But I've already found something that I didn't know before. I always find something new when I do a Bible study from reading. All right, so let's go to, I think we're going to go to Daniel chapter 4. Did you know Nebuchadnezzar was uh, in some ways, you know, a wicked king. But God humbled him and allowed him to see some things. But do you know that the fourth chapter of the book of Daniel? Uh, well, let's read it. Daniel chapter 4, verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar the king unto all people, nations and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. I, first person, I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the high God hath wrought toward me. How great are his signs, and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion from generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar. Did you catch that? Nebuchadnezzar wrote this part of the book of Daniel. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in mine house, and flourishing in my palace, I saw a dream which made me afraid, and the thoughts upon my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. Um, therefore made I a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might make known unto me the interpretation of the dream. And that's what, you know, we had just read in chapter 2. All right, so uh, we're going to skip. Okay, let's skip to verse 8. Uh, basically, in a nutshell, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. His saucers can't interpret the dream, but Daniel's going to interpret it. And yeah, maybe we should just read the whole thing. What do you think? 
All right, Daniel 4.4. 4. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in mine house and flourishing in my palace. I saw a dream which made me afraid, and the thoughts upon my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. Therefore made I a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might make known unto me the interpretation of the dream. Then came the magicians, the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers, and I told a dream before them, but they could not make known unto me the interpretation thereof. But at the last, Daniel came in before me, whose name was Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God, and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. Gods? You know, I, I can't, I could never understand. The Lord used Nebuchadnezzar to, for part of the book of Daniel, and yet he's has gods, plural. Hopefully it's Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, I, but I don't think so. According to the name of my God, and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods, and before him I told the dream, saying, O Belteshazzar, that's Daniel, O Belteshazzar, master of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in thee, and no secret troubleth thee. Tell me the visions of my dream that I may, that I have seen, and the interpretation thereof. Thus were the visions of mine head in, in my bed. I saw, and behold, a tree in the midst of the earth, and the height thereof was great. A tree. I did an entire Bible study on trees. Because the Bible's full of symbolism. And you got to let the Bible interpret the Bible. Okay, so... And behold, a tree in the midst of the earth, and the height thereof was great. The tree grew and was strong, and the height thereof reached unto heaven, and the sight thereof to the end of all the earth. This is symbolic. The leaves thereof were fair, and the fruit thereof much, and in it was meat for all. The beasts of the field had shadow under it, and the fowls of the heaven dwelt in the boughs thereof, and all flesh was fed of it. I saw in the visions of my head upon my bed, and behold, a watcher and an holy one came down from heaven. What's a watcher? Angels watching. That's what a watcher is. A holy one, right? He cried aloud and said thus, Hew down the tree. In other words, um, cut it down, right? Hew down the tree and cut off his branches Shake off his leaves and scatter his fruit. Let the beasts get away from under it and the fowls from his branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump of his roots in the earth. Even with a band of iron, a band of iron and brass. So even though this tree was partially destroyed, the roots are left. Now, if you cut a tree down, and you leave the roots, a lot of times it'll grow back. But it's got a band of iron and brass. Nevertheless, leave the stump of his roots in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass, in the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts in the grass of the earth. Uh, let's see, let his heart be changed from man's, and let a beast's heart be given unto him, and let seven times pass over him. So, uh, Nebuchadnezzar is going to be turned into a beast, right? Uh, for seven times. A time is a year. Verse 17. This matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones, and that must be the angels, to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth, the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it, giveth it to whomsoever he will. Oh yeah, God rules, he gives the kingdom to whoever he wants, and, uh, and giveth it to whomsoever he will, and setteth up over it the basest of men. And I've said this a number of times. 
when people don't want Christ as king and the Bible as their law book, they're going to give you Joseph Stalin, the communist leader of Russia during World War II, who murdered millions and millions and millions of Christians in Russia, formerly Christian Russia. He gives the Germans Adolf Hitler. He gives the Americans Obama and probably Hillary coming or Trump. I don't know. We'll see. The basest of men. You know what a base man is? Somebody evil, somebody wicked. Not it's the opposite of righteous. All right, verse 18. This dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. See, God gave Nebuchadnezzar, the Holy Spirit, to, to write the book of Daniel. It's amazing. Now thou, O Belteshazzar, declare the interpretation thereof, for as much as all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known unto me the interpretation, but thou art able, for the spirit of the holy gods is in thee. Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished, astonished for one hour, and his thoughts troubled him. The king spake and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation thereof trouble thee. Belteshazzar answered and said, My lord, the dream be to them that hate thee and the interpretation thereof to thine enemies. The tree that thou sawest, which grew and was strong, whose height reached unto heaven, and the sight thereof to all the earth, whose leaves were fair, and the fruit thereof much, and in it was meat for all, under which the beasts of the field dwelt, and upon whose branches the fowls of the heaven had their habitation. It is thou, O king. So this, this huge tree... He says, it is thou, O king, it's Nebuchadnezzar, okay? It is thou, O king, that art grown and become strong, for thy greatness is grown and reacheth unto heaven, and thy dominion to the end of the earth. Do you know that the um, in the Bible, the kingdom of Babylon was the, I wouldn't, well, when you say, I would say the greatest of kingdoms, uh, I don't mean that it was great as in righteous, but it was, it conquered basically all the known world. I mean, Babylon covered everywhere. And when you read about Mystery Babylon in the book of Revelation, the religion of Babylon has spread throughout all the earth. When you study the religion of Babylon, the religion, okay, I mean, it's prevalent in every, everything and everywhere. In Judaism, they have a book called the Talmud. Matter of fact, it's called the Babylonian Talmud because they brought it from Babylon. It's the rabbi's interpretation of what the Bible really should be. And then you've got... Um, Things like Easter came out of Babylon, um, doesn't come out of the Bible. Uh, bunny rabbits and Easter eggs, chocolate bunnies, where's that in the Bible? It's not. And you've got all kinds of other stuff that came from Babylon. I mean, all kinds of stuff. All kinds of religious practices. So... The trees who, whose height reached up to heaven, verse 22, It is thou, O king, that art grown and become strong, for thy greatness is grown and reacheth unto heaven, and thy dominion to the end of the earth. And whereas the king saw a watcher and an holy one coming down from heaven and saying, Hew the tree down and destroy it, yet leave the stump of the roots thereof in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass, and the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let the portion be with the beasts of the field till seven times pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the king. So we're getting ready to interpret the deal. 
All right, so verse 25. That they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over thee, till thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Why did Hitler come to power? God willed it. Why did Stalin come to power? God willed it. Why is Obama in power? God willed it. If Hitler, Hitlery, I mean, I'm sorry, if Hillary gets elected, or is it Hitlery? I'm not sure. Um, God wills it. So, verse 26. And whereas they commanded to leave the stump of the roots, the kingdom shall be sure unto thee after that, Thou shalt have known that the heavens do rule. Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee, and break off thy sins by righteousness, and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. All this came upon the king Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of twelve months he walked in the palace of the king, kingdom of Babylon, the king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I, that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? Oh yes, I did all this. I did it by my hands. Pride, people. God hates pride. While the word was yet in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee. And they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee, until thou knowest that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. And the same hour was a thing, thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from men, and did eat grass as oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his hairs were grown like eagle's feathers, and his nails like bird's claws. Uh, what's your hair going to look like if you don't comb it for, and you don't cut it for seven years? And what are your nails going to look like if you don't cut them for seven years? It's, you know, it's... And at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and my understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High. He's not praising the gods now. And I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. And the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the, in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? In other words, nobody's going to tell God, What do you think you're doing? At the same time, my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom, mine honor and brightness returned unto me, and my counselors and my lords sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment, and those who walk in pride he is able to abase. If you're abased, that means you're brought low. All right, let's skip to Daniel chapter 7. And this is a end time verse, big time. Daniel 7 chapter 1. I'm sorry, Daniel chapter 7 and verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, okay, Belshazzar was the son of Nebuchadnezzar. I guess Nebuchadnezzar died. I'm not sure. Um, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Daniel spake and said, I saw my vision by night. Behold, the four winds of the heavens strove upon the great sea. Now remember that word. 
and strove upon the great sea. And the four beasts came up from the sea. And four beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. So you got four beasts that are coming up from the sea, right? And what's the sea? Well, the Bible's going to explain to you what the sea is. We're going to go to Revelation, uh, I think it's chapter 17. I'm not sure. I'll, uh, let's see. Where, yeah, Revelation 17. We're going to go to Revelation 17 after we get through reading this. Um, and four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse, one from another. Diverse means, uh, you've heard of diversity, it means different. The first was like a lion. Jesus is likened to um, the lion of the tribe of Judah, right? The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man, and, the man's, and a man's heart was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second, like to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it, between the teeth of it. And they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. I did a study on the bear. Um, you know, communist Russia, to me, that was their symbol, the bear. You may not agree with me, and that's fine. I might be wrong. But it 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 aroused it ar it arised and devoured much flesh. They murdered many 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 millions of Christians. After this, I beheld and lo another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. And a lot of people say that was the kingdom of Greece after Alexander the Great died. He had pretty much conquered the entire known world. Matter of fact, he conquered the nation, uh, the land area of what was the nation of Israel and Judah, Jerusalem and Samaria, Egypt, uh, Greece, that whole, that whole area. He had conquered that whole area. And let me tell you something. When you conquer an area, the people that you conquer learn your language. You don't learn their language. When when Alexander the Great conquered Egypt, he didn't learn Egyptian. He learned they learned the Egyptians learned Greek. So the people in the land of Israel don't think of night what the modern day state of Israel. Don't think of that. Think of back in Bible days. That land was conquered by the Greeks. What was the New Testament written in? Greek. It was the common language of commerce back in those days. Now, shortly thereafter, in the time of Christ, the Romans had recently conquered that area. So the language of the government was in Latin. The common people spoke Greek. It was the language of commerce. If you went anywhere in the Mediterranean and you spoke Greek, you could get, a, you could get by. And all these Hebrew roots people that tell you, oh, Jesus spoke Hebrew. Well, I'm sure he did in the temple. But I bet you the common people, I bet you a lot of times, I bet you he spoke Greek. Wouldn't surprise me. I'm not saying it's true, but it wouldn't surprise me. Paul spoke Greek. He had to. When he went to Greece, he and Thessalonia and uh, Ephesus, you know, the book of Ephesians, the book of Thessalonians, the book of Colossians. He had to speak Greek to them. He couldn't have spoken Hebrew to them. They wouldn't have understood what he was saying. Well, maybe the Jews in the, their synagogues would have. But he didn't just hang out in the synagogues. He went to the common people. They knew Greek. And uh, Hebrew roots people hate, they just absolutely hate and despise this information. But the New Testament was written in Greek, not Hebrew, for a reason. What can I tell you? So, Daniel chapter 7 and verse 6. After this I beheld and 
I beheld in low another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl, and a beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. The thing was, is after Nebuchadnezzar died, his four generals, his four main generals, divided the kingdom between the four of them. And then a couple of them actually had wars against each other. I mean, is that stupid or what, you know? But um, the conquered people learned Greek. All right, Daniel 7.7. 7. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly. This is Satan's fourth kingdom, people. And it had great iron teeth. Iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces. What did it break in pieces? The clay. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse. It was different. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And it had ten horns. When they had a king in Israel to be a... Um, when they were going to appoint, when the Lord was going to appoint a king over Israel, he took, uh, he had a prophet take a horn of oil and would anoint their head with oil. A horn symbolized power, government. So think about that. I mean, I could do a whole study on just the horns, but you know, do, do, if you want, you know, go to like uh, Blue Letter Bible or download uh, Mike Hoggard's Pure Bible Search and then type in horn or horns. See what pops up. Sometimes it's talking about something sticking out of an animal's head. Sometimes it's talking about something that they would anoint a future king's head with. So. Uh, let's see. So there was a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, strong exceedingly, had great iron teeth, devoured, breaking pieces, uh, and it was different, diverse from all the other beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I consider the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns, Plucked up by the roots, behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. So obviously, this is a figure of speech. You know, horns don't have a mouth. They don't talk. Okay? Verse 9. I beheld till the thrones were cast down. Okay, the thrones are going to be cast down. And the Ancient of Days did sit. This is talking about Christ. And the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. Read Revelation chapter 1, describing what Je John describes what Jesus looks like. Matter of fact, we'll, we'll go there um, right after we do this. And the Ancient of Days, why is he called the Ancient of Days? Because Christ was ancient. You know, Christ is eternal. He's God the Son. And the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as wool, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame and his wheels as burning fire. You can read about, uh, in the book of Ezekiel, um, the wheel within a wheel. And a lot of people will read that and say, see, see, uh, uh, God wrote a Bible. He, he's really a, a UFO alien. And they write these stupid books. They turn God into a, an alien with a, a flying saucer. I don't believe that, but... Some people do. Verse 10. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand 
thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. This is right out of Revelation, people. You know, the, the, the judgment seat, the book of life. I mean, all this stuff is right into the book of Revelation. I, I, I could make this a probably a five or ten hour study if I really put my mind to it. But like I say, if you've never read the entire Bible, you're, uh, you're robbing yourself. The judgment was set and the books were opened. I beheld them because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake. I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. Oh boy. Don't we read about the beast being cast into the lake of fire? This ties right into the book of Revelation. I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As concerning the rest of the beast, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man... Didn't Jesus call himself that all the time? Yes, Jesus called himself the Son of Man. Why? Because he was God come in the flesh. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man come with the clouds of heaven. I did an entire Bible study on the clouds. One like the Son of Man come with the clouds of heaven and come to the ancient of days, and they brought him near before them. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. So this last kingdom is going to be something. Verse 15. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near unto one of them that stood by and asked him the truth of all this. Probably an angel, right? So he told me and made me know the interpretation of the things. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings. Remember, you saw the four beasts rise up out of the sea? The Bible tells you right here. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings, which shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. How's that? How long is that? Forever, right? Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron whose teeth were of iron and his nails of brass, which devoured, break in pieces, and stamped the residue with his feet. And the ten horns that were in his head and of the other which came up and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints. Okay. I beheld in the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. Oh yeah. So this horn's going to make war and it's going to beat the snot out of the saints. And if you think the saints are a bunch of unbelieving Jews that practice Kabbalah over in the Middle East, well, you're, you could believe, believe in fairies and tooth fairies and, and Easter bunnies if you want, but what can I tell you? I beheld in the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them until 
the Ancient of Days came, that's Christ, until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour, and shall devour the whole earth, and tr shall tread it down, and break it in pieces. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings, that shall arise, and another shall arise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and shall and think to change times and laws. Ooh. And shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. So he's going to change the times, the calendar, and he's going to change the laws. And they shall be given into his hand until a time, that's a year, and a times, that's two, and a dividing of time, that's half. So for three and a half years, doesn't in the Bible say that there are going to be, that's going to be 42 months or 1260 days? That the beast is going to rule? Yes, it does. If if the uh, Daniel interprets Revelation, Revelation interprets Daniel. It's wonderful. So, who changed the times and the laws? Well, everybody will point out, oh, the Catholic Church did that. Well, they did, sort of. You had uh, Gregory. I think Gregory was a pope. He changed the calendar, and he changed the laws, but so did the Jews. The Jews changed the calendar. Do you know they have a month that they named for Tammuz, T-A-M-M-U-Z? Do you know who Tammuz was? He was, uh, I believe, let's see, if my memory serves me correctly, he was the son of Semiramis, which is also Ishtar, which is also Easter. He was a pagan satanic deity, and the Jews named a month after him. And did they change the laws? Oh yeah, they did. It's called the, Ta the Babylonian Talmud. Jesus called it their traditions. They called it the tr traditions of the elders. Jesus says, why do you make the word of God of none effect by your traditions? Jesus used the word hypocrites with the Jews so many times because he said they, through their traditions, they made the word of God of none effect. I mean, if you don't believe me, read the eighth chapter of the book of John in the King James Bible. Yeah. Yeah. Read it sometime. Uh, if you don't believe me, read uh, Matthew chapter 6. Jesus speaking, Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues. Ooh. Do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues, and in the streets, that they may have the glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Matthew 6 and verse 5, Jesus speaking, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Huh. And if you really want to read about uh, the word hypocrites, Read Matthew 23. And if you don't know what a Pharisee is, a Pharisee is a Jew. Jesus speaking. Matthew 23, 
verse 13. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye devour widows' houses, and for a long pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Uh, uh, you know, if you don't like the words of Jesus, well, what can I tell you? Then you can enjoy the, uh, the other guy that's coming, the fourth kingdom beast. All right, let's go back to uh, Daniel 7 and uh, verse 25. And he shall speak great words against Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. So, you know, you've had the Catholic Church, the Jews, they all change the times and laws. That's why the calendar's all screwed up. I, you know, I don't even know if the, the Sabbath day is Saturday. I'm not even sure, 100%. And they shall be given unto his, uh, and they shall be given into his hand for a time and times and the dividing of time. But the judgment shall shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it unto the end. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Here, too, is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my cognitions had troubled me, and my countenance changed to me, but I kept the matter in my heart. Now, if you want to read uh, the eighth chapter of Daniel, uh, it gives you a little bit of interpretation of what's going on with the, the beasts. Uh, let's see. Daniel saw a ram, okay, and the ram had horns, okay? Daniel 8, verse 20. Uh, let's see. No, verse 19. And he said, Behold, I will make thee known what shall be in the last end of the indignation, for at the time appointed the end shall be. The ram which thou sawest, having two horns, are the kings of Media, Media and Persia. And a lot of people don't know it, but Babylon was conquered by Persia and uh, Medea. And uh, Darius the Great. And he was, he was uh, very kind to the true Jews in the book of... Uh, and he allowed them to go back to Jerusalem, gave them the temple, the gold from the temple, and allowed them to... Um, rebuild the temple. You could read about that where they left Babylon. You could read about that in the book of Ezra and the book of Nehemiah. All right, so two horns are the kings of Media and Persia. And the rough goat is the king of Grecia. And the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king, Greece. And then uh, your historians will try to tell you, oh, well, uh, Alexander was a uh, Macedonian. Macedonians are not Greek. I'm like, what? The Macedonians spoke Greek. Okay? I mean, really, you know? I mean, if, if, if they speak Greek and they were part of Greece and they're next to Greece, they're probably Greeks. Okay? But they'll try to tell you, oh, well, they're different. I don't think so. Uh, but the Macedonians, uh, which I believe are part was part of Greece, conquered Greece and then spread out everywhere. Okay, and the rough and that was probably Alexander the Great that conquered the land uh, of Israel prior to the Romans. Okay, that I spoke about earlier. And the rough goat is the king of Grecia, and the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. Now that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms should stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, 
a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own uh, power. And he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. And if you think the Jews that practice Kabbalah in the Middle East are the holy people, well, that's up to you. Personally, I have a hard time believing that. And through, and through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. Do you know the word craft? You know what witches call their, their, their magic? The craft? Witchcraft. The craft. That's what they call it. Will this guy be a, a Kabbalist? Personally, I believe the beast, the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, I personally believe he's going to be a Jew, just like Judas Iscariot. Do you know the word Judas is the Greek rendering of the word Judah or Jew? Judas Iscariot, his, his, even, his very name means Judah which was one of the 12 tribes of Israel. So he betrayed Jesus. Judas, the Jew, or of Judah, betrayed Jesus. He was called the son of perdition. Why can't the Antichrist be the same thing as Judas? Why not? I don't know. It's just, I did a Bible study on that too. And through his policy also, he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. Remember Paul and Thessalonians said, uh, when they shall cry peace and safety, sudden destruction shall come up, up cometh upon them, as woman that travaileth with child. And by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the Prince of Princes. Who's the Prince of Princes? Christ. But he shall be broken without hand. And the vision of the evening and the morning, which was told is true. Wherefore, shut thou up the vision, for it shall be for many days. Oh yeah, it's going to be shut up for many days. Our days, I believe. And I, Daniel, fainted was sick certain days. Afterward, I rose up and did the king's business. And I was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. That's some heavy stuff, huh? Uh, let's see. Matter of fact, let's read Daniel chapter 9. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, Medea, right? Media, we just read that, right? which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. That was the Persians, right? In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood the books, the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came, into, came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So there's your 70 years of uh, captivity, right? And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him. Big difference there. Keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. So God keeps the covenant and mercy, shows mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. Boy, that's a dirty word nowadays. Uh, verse 5, Daniel speaking. We have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. 
Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants, the prophets, which spake in thy name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. Um, so you can read where, you know, you can keep reading this, but I think you get the general idea. You know, I haven't even started on the iron part yet. And we're well over an hour. But I'm going to keep going. Turn to Revelation chapter 1 and verse 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and heard behind me a great voice, as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. He didn't say Aleph Tav, the first and last of the Hebrew alphabet. He said, I am Alpha and Omega. Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet, and Omega is the last letter of the Greek alphabet. You've heard of alphabet? Well, that comes from Alpha, Beta. Alpha was A and Beta was B. They said Alpha, instead of Alpha, Beta, they said Alphabet. That's where we get that from. It's from the Greek. Okay? It's not the Aleph Tav. The New Testament was written in Greek. I know the Hebrew roots people hate that, but it's true. Saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, book of Ephesians, right? And unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. The book of Laodicea didn't like uh, the book of Revelation. I wonder why. Verse 12, And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden, golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. Who's this? This is Christ. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man clothed with a garment down to the foot and gird about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs, his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. John's describing what Christ looks like. His head and his hairs were white as wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as a sound of many waters. Now, didn't we just read in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 9? Well, in Daniel 7 and verse 8, uh... That's the beast, right? And then in verse 9, it says, I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like that, like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. White robes, right? Revelation 6 and verse 11. And white robes were given unto them, I'm sorry, were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. You know, one of the things I have a problem with, uh, with those that teach the pre-trib rapture, is that they teach that those that, are caught up in the pre-trib rapture, they're going up to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Well, while the marriage supper of the Lamb's going on, all the other people here are being killed in the tribulation. I mean, are these people missing the marriage supper of the Lamb while they're getting just killed on earth? You know, it just... But these people are given white robes, 
and that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. It says they were to rest. It doesn't say they're at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Revelation 7 and verse 9, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Verse 13, And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? Uh, 14, And I said unto them, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white, in the blood of the Lamb. Okay. All right, let's go to Revelation chapter 17, verse 1, I guess. We're going to read the whole thing, probably. All right, Revelation chapter 7, 17, and verse 1. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Now remember that. The great whore sits upon many waters. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Didn't we read about ten horns in Daniel? And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color. Purple means royalty. And decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her head was name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Now, Babylon was a city in Iraq, according to archaeologists and historians. And it no longer exists. It was destroyed. It was covered in sand. Okay? So physical Babylon doesn't exist. But this Babylon is a mystery. It's the spiritual aspect of Babylon. Okay? It's the spirit of Babylon. Now, people argue that. And they say, Our ba there's no such thing as spiritual Babylon. Well, well, then go to, go to Iraq and, and sit on that sand pile and you can call it Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, but there's nothing there but sand and ruins. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus and when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. So this woman is drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Now, Rome uh, and the Vatican killed many people during the Inquisition and during the so-called Reformation. And Islam, the Ottoman Empire, which was uh, an empire that lasted for 500 years, uh, it's in what is called modern-day Turkey, which used to be called Greece. It was the capital of the Christian Eastern Empire of Rome. And then the Ottoman Turks, Muslims, came in and destroyed it and killed all the Christians, all the Greeks. So Turkey used to be called Greece. That was another kingdom. And it lasted for 400 years or 500 years. And it was huge. Matter of fact, they invaded Austria. They were at the steps of Vienna, which is, uh, I'm not sure if it's the capital of Austria, but it's a major city. 
Um, and Austria was in danger of collapsing and being destroyed by the Turks, the Muslims. And the king of Poland gathered virtually his entire army and, and, and uh, took his horsemen and, and plowed into the, the sides of the Ottoman Turks and destroyed their camps. And then they retreated. Um, you've heard of the Serbians and the Bosnians. The Serbians were the Christians. The Bosnians were the Muslim Turks that had invaded that area. And uh, when Bill Clinton was getting his, uh, his sperm on Monica Lewinsky's dress, if you, I'm trying not to be vulgar here, but what did he do? He bombed the Serbians. The Serbians were the Christians. Bill Clinton bombed the Christians to help the Muslims. Uh, you know, it's, what can I tell you? So, yes, Washington, D.C. is part of this mess. So is London. So is the Vatican. You know, ten horns, people. Seven heads, seven horns. What can I tell you? And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints, and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. Verse 8. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. Well, Judas Iscariot was called the son of perdition. Think about that. He walked with Jesus. He performed miracles. And yet he betrayed Jesus. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. Whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world? Does that mean there are people whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life from the foundation of the world? Does that mean there's people that will... Uh, think about that next time you go to the Free Will Baptist Church. Uh, when they beheld the beast that was and is not, and yet is. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And, the, and, and there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seventh and goeth into perdition. Now, everybody will love to tell you, oh, the seven heads or seven mountains on which the woman sits, that's the Vatican. Well, um, Rome's on seven hills. So was Istanbul, which is the capital of Turkey which was the Ottoman Empire. Look that up, people. Ottoman Empire. O-T-T-O-M-A-N. Empire. Their capital, Istanbul. Seven hills. Jerusalem is on seven hills. Moscow, Russia, communism is on seven hills. I hear Seattle, Washington is on seven hills. You ever heard of Microsoft? Seattle. Uh, there's, there's a bunch of others, too. Some people told me Washington, D.C. is on seven hills. Uh, others, you know, they say London, this and that. I don't know. I, I just know Jerusalem is also on seven hills. Matter of fact, an Israeli website for tourism will take you on a tour of those seven hills if you, uh, if you wishes, wish to. But um, they always point you to Rome. Rome, 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 Rome. Well, Rome's not the only one. So, 
verse 11. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seventh that goeth into perdition. And the seven horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as king one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them for he is Lord of lords and king of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. This ties right into what we were reading in the book of Daniel, doesn't it? I think I'm going to close this out at, at the end of this chapter because it, I could just go on and on and on. Verse 15, And he saith unto me, The waters, remember the beast that rose up out of the sea? The waters which thou sawest, where the horse sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. Remember the beast that rose up out of the sea? The kings that came out of the sea? The waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. You don't get this stuff with the modern Bible versions. They destroy all this. They change the words. You can't link words with words that give you the interpretation with the modern Bibles that are easier to read and to comprehend, right? According to James White and all those bunch of heretics, in my opinion. Oh yeah, those modern Bibles, they're better. They got older manuscripts. Get away from that King James Bible. That's, that's you know, that's old school. That's hard to read. You can't understand that. Uses all those archaic words. How terrible. You know what? Get yourself a Webster's 1828 dictionary with a King James Bible and you can understand everything. Webster, yeah, Webster, the dictionary guy. Yeah, 1828, he put a dictionary together and he all the words in the King James Bible are in his dictionary. Even the theological terms. And if you and I've got a master's degree in the Bible. And all the theological words like justification, sanctification, holiness, when you look up those words in Webster's 1828 dictionary, guess what? The definitions are on the money. They're perfect. That guy knew Greek. He knew Hebrew. He knew English. He knew German. He knew French. He knew Italian. He knew Latin. He was not just, uh, he was a language scholar, a linguist. This guy knew his stuff. And people think, oh, well, we're smarter than they were back then. This guy spent years of his life putting the dictionary together. What can I tell you? But the modern Bibles destroy this stuff. And he said unto me, the waters which thou sawest where the horse sitteth, our peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues, and the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree, and to give their kingdom unto the beast, until the words, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Ooh, the great city. What city is that? The great city. Ooh. Well, in the book of Jonah, Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, was called the great city. Okay. And uh, there's a few places called the great city. But... We're talking of, in, in the book of Revelation. Okay. Let's take a look at what the Bible says. Go to Revelation chapter 11. Um, let's see. Let's do Revelation chapter 11 and verse 3. And I will give power unto my two witnesses. This is the two witnesses, people, that are going to confront the beast and the false prophet. 
And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, sacked, clothed in sackcloth. That's 1,260 days. Uh, that's three and a half years, people. That ties in right with what we'd read in the book of Daniel. The time, times, and a dividing of time. Three and a half years. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire... If any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Now, I don't know if you know it, but uh, when it says fire comes out of their mouth, I mean, it's, it's not going to be a flamethrower, okay? But the thing was, uh, Elijah, which I believe is going to be one of these two people, he called, out of his mouth he spoke words, and fire came down from the sky and devoured his enemies. Uh, Fifty soldiers and a captain. Twice that I remember. I did an hour and 45 minute study on the book of El uh, on Elijah. Not the book of Elijah, but on Elijah. I did an hour and 45 minute study. Type in Chaplain Bob Walker and Elijah and it'll pop up. Uh, Elijah's a very interesting character. He's going to be very important. He's going to be one of these two witnesses in the end time, and I'm I'm almost 100% positive. Maybe I'm only 99.999. What can I tell you? So, if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies, and if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven, just like Elijah did in the days of Ahab. These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over waters to turn them to blood, just like Moses did under Pharaoh, and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast, the beast, that ascendeth out of the bottles bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt where also our Lord was crucified. Now, I don't know about you, but my Lord, who is Jesus, who is Christ, was crucified in Jerusalem. He wasn't crucified in Rome. He wasn't crucified in London, England. He wasn't crucified in Washington, D.C. He wasn't crucified in Istanbul, Turkey. Jesus was crucified in Jerusalem. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. Where also our Lord was crucified. Why Sodom? Jerusalem has had a number of gay pride events where hundreds of thousands of people have been marching down the street celebrating their gay pride. Look it up on YouTube. Type in Jerusalem gay pride. And then you could keep reading on where, you know, their, their dead bodies are going to lie in the street of the, you know, and then they're not going to let them be buried. And then after three and a half days or whatever, God's going to raise them up and then they're going to go back to heaven. Um, well, I guess we could read that, huh? And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a an half and shall not suffer or allow and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another. Just like Christmas, right? 
because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. Oh, these two evil prophets, they, they turned our water to blood. They are horrible people. They, they blasphemed our God, the beast. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither, and they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And the self self and the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell. And in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were frightened and gave glory to the God of heaven. So there's going to be a, glory, a remnant that are going to give glory to the God of heaven. And there's going to be an earthquake. I say this is Jerusalem. People argue with me, but whatever. Uh, you know, if, if, if you're... If your uh, Messiah was crucified, if your Lord was crucified somewhere else other than Jerusalem, well, that's your Messiah. I don't know. If your Messiah was crucified in Rome, what's his name? Or if your Messiah was crucified in London, what's his name? I don't know. But it ain't Jesus who's Christ. Now, if you have any doubts at all about what Babylon is, Turn to Revelation 18, verse 21, Let's, and I'm going to close it out after this. And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall the great, that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. Verse 24, And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. Okay? And in her was found the blood of prophets prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. So Babylon was responsible for the blood of prophets. Now, since uh, since the, the apostles of Christ died, there's been no prophets on the face of the earth that I am aware of. Maybe there were, but I'm not aware of them. I don't claim to be a prophet of God. But the prophets of God were people like Moses, uh, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Amos, Obadiah. Uh, those are prophets. Those are books in the Bible. Okay? All right. So, Revelation 16, 6. For they have shed the blood of saints and of prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. Babylon, right? Revelation 17, 6. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints, with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. So Mystery Babylon killed the prophets. Who does Jesus say killed the prophets? Jesus, I trust. Luke chapter 13 and verse 33. Nevertheless, I must walk today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet perish out of Jerusalem. Oh, the King James Bible must be mistranslated because I know that's London. Oh, no, I mean, uh, oh, no, that's got to be Rome. No, that's the uh, Washington, D.C., right? Or uh, Turkey, Istanbul, or, oh, that's what they tell you. They don't believe the words of Jesus. Nevertheless, I must walk today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet perish out of Jerusalem. Where did God send the prophets? To Jerusalem, people! Matthew 23 and verse 37. Jesus speaking, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets. Does it get any plainer than that? O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Mm. Want to know why the Hebrew roots people hate Paul? 
Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For, they, for ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. Even as they have of the Jews. Who? Who? The Jews. Even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us and they please not God and they please not God and are contrary to all men forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved to fill up their sins always for the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. Did you read the Catholic Church there? No. No. Matthew 23 and verse 34. Be, wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye shall kill and crucify, and some of them ye shall scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city. Who hangs out in the synagogues? I'll give you th three guesses. And it's not, and, and, and it's not the, um, it's not the Muslims. Verse 35, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel. From the blood of righteous Abel? Cain slew Abel. That upon you, that's very important. Remember this. That upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zacharias, son of Barchias, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. I'll tell you, people, the Jews' holy book is called the Talmud, and it came from Babylon. If you go to Amazon and you type in Talmud and scroll through it, you'll see the Babylonian Talmud, Mystery Babylon, people, Mystery Babylon. They may not completely rule from, for now. But they're 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 trying to set things up, and they're you know the world's in such a spiritual state that if a world leader comes, oh yeah. All right, let's go back to uh, Daniel seven, which tied into Revelation one. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the ancient of, day, ancient of days did sit, whose garment was white as wool, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and its wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. Behold, then, I be, I'm sorry, I beheld then because of the voice of the great words, which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. Huh. Let's take a look at that. All right. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 20. And the beast was taken and with him the false prophet, which wrought miracles before him. So the beast is going to have a false prophet that's going to do all kinds of miracles. People are going to believe this stuff. Everybody's going to believe it, virtually everybody, right? And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image, these both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. 
Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's go to Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Oh, yeah. And that's the end, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. We're looking at the, in God's eyes, he sees the end from to the beginning, the beginning to the end, and he lets us know, just to know, he lets you know the, the end from the beginning and the beginning to the end, just to let you know that I'm in charge. Things might look black and dark and evil, but guess what? I'm in charge. And a lot of people don't know it. But, you know, the reason God's going to let this fourth beast come and make things really, really bad is because people want a savior. They don't want to go to hell. They don't want to be destroyed. They want a savior. But they don't want a king. They don't want Christ as king. They don't want his laws. And... You know, every king has a kingdom, and every kingdom has laws and rules. But people don't want Christ as king. Even churches. I mean, even today, if you if you say that you should uh, keep God's laws, and I'm not saying you should keep them for salvation, but if, if you say that you should keep the commandments... They'll throw the Lordship Salvation card at you and say, oh, well, you're trying to earn your salvation. Boy, let me tell you something. There's nothing I could do to earn my salvation. Absolutely nothing. But can you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and be, keep your job as a hitman for the mafia? That's, that's stretching it, people. That's pushing it. really is. You know... I think if, you were, if you're a hitman from the mafia and you get saved, I think you ought to quit your job and find something else to do. What do you think? What can I tell you? So, uh, so the beast and the false prophet go into the lake of fire. And the horns are going to make war with the saints. All right, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We're getting ready to close this out. Thessalonians was a city in Greece, Thessalonica. Paul wrote this in Greek to Greeks. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 1, verse 2 now. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, peace and safety, didn't it say that the last beast will destroy wonder, wonderfully with peace? Oh, yeah. For when they shall say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night, not of darkness. All right, contrast that with Daniel chapter 8 and verse 23. And in the latter time, the latter time, that's, that's the last days, right? And in the latter time of their kingdom, not God's kingdom, their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. Oh, yeah? You people don't want Christ as king? No problem. I'm going to give you the other guy. That's what God the Father probably thinks something along those lines. I mean, that, that's thus saith Bob, not thus saith the Lord. But, but you could read. You could read the book of Judges. You could read the book of Jeremiah. You could read the book of Ezekiel. God follows the same thing. You know, in, in, in the third chapter of Genesis, God says, Thou shalt not touch the tree of good and evil. 
Well, they do. They touched it. He said, well, you're going to die. Boom. You know, people don't get it. A king of fierce countenance and understanding, dark sentences shall stand up, and his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. By whose power? The devil. But not by his own power, and he shall destroy wonderfully, and shall prosper and practice, and shall destroy the mighty and holy people. And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and to magnify himself in his heart, and by peace, and by peace, shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. Well, almost two hours, and I've barely done the introduction. Do you know that I haven't even started on the Iron Kingdom? When we return, we're going to be going to Genesis chapter 4. Probably the most controversial thing that you'll ever get in the Bible is the, uh, the thing that some people call the sea lines. When you take a look at Genesis 6, the giants, well, just know this for a fact. The modern churches, the modern modernist churches, even those King James Bible-believing Baptist churches will tell you that in Genesis chapter 6, the sons of God were believers, and then the daughter's men were unbelievers. And the, the believing men married the unbelieving women. And then they had giants for children. And then God got mad because the believers married those stupid unbelievers. And then he wiped the world out in a flood. The flood of Noah. And then after that, well, then, you know, you had Goliath and, you know, people with six fingers and six toes and giants and... Uh, I mean, when do believers and unbelievers have giants with six fingers and six toes? It's nonsense, people. It's nonsense. If you uh, go to my other channel, if you go to my other channel, matter of fact, uh, well, I've got a playlist called The Angels That Sinned. Genesis 6. It's myself and Mike Hoggard and a few other things, but there's like over 10 hours of studies. And when you get done, you will have absolutely no, no false illusions of what happened in Genesis 6. The fallen angels, and if you don't know who the sons of God are, read Job 38. Okay? The sons of God shouted for joy when the foundations of the earth were created. When the earth was created, the sons of God shouted for joy. Adam didn't come until six days after the earth was created. Okay, now Adam is called a son of God because after all, who was his father? God took him him of the dust of the earth, probably the clay, the iron clay, maybe, I don't know, formed it, breathed the breath of life, and he became a living soul. God, Adam's called a son of God. Jesus is called the only begotten son of God. And in Genesis, I mean, I'm sorry, Job chapter 38, the angels that shouted for joy at the foundation of the earth before Adam was ever formed, Six days before Adam was ever formed, they shouted for joy. Angels are the sons of God. And then the, they'll argue with you and say, well, how can Satan be a son of God? He, he, he rebelled against God. Well, God created all the angels good. And he was their father. Yes, they rebelled. 
They fell, and now they oppose him, and they would kill him if they had a chance. But they were still, God is still their father. You know, just because you, 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 you know, you can't change who your father is, and you can't change who your mother is. Angels are sons of God, people. So was Adam, and Jesus is called the only begotten son. Believers are never called sons of God until the New Testament, when they're born again of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. I'm paraphrasing. So, all right, well, I've been ranting and raving for two hours now. And, uh, and why am I telling you all this about the fallen angels and the having relations with the women? Because if you don't understand that, the Iron Kingdom will make no sense. Because it ties right into it. The Iron Kingdom is always tied in with the Canaanites, the fallen angels, and those that oppose God. And remember, it said that the toes were partly iron and partly clay. They mingle together, but they're not going to cleave to one another. Very prophetic, people. I told you, this is going to be very controversial. I mean, it's not to me. I, it makes perfect sense. Why did God tell Israel to go into the land of Canaan and exterminate all the Canaanites? He said, wipe out everything that breathes. Why? Oh, they were unbelievers. Well, they were satanic hybrids. And people say, well, I don't believe that. Well, it doesn't matter whether you believe it or not. If you don't believe, if you're handling a snake and you say, well, you know what, I don't believe the snake's venomous or poisonous, and it bites you, you're going to get sick, maybe die. It doesn't matter what you believe. And if you're playing with a gun that you believe is unloaded and the gun goes off and shoots you in the head or you're some of your friend and they die, well, I didn't believe it was loaded. It doesn't matter what you believe. You may not like the doctrine. I don't like the doctrine of the satanic seed line thing of Genesis 6. I don't like it. But it happened. God didn't destroy the world in the flood for no good reason. And, and believers and unbelievers don't have giants for children with six fingers and six toes. It just doesn't happen, people. But it ties in with the Iron Kingdom. It's because people don't want Christ as king. So he's going to give us the other guy. And the Christians that don't want Christ as king, that don't want his rules, his laws, they're going to have to pay for their faith with their lives. Sadly, over 90% of the church world doesn't believe that. But it's coming. It's coming. It's coming. It's amazing the number of people that disfellowship with me because I don't believe in the pre-trib rapture. And they will even tell you it's a deal breaker. I'm not fellowshipping with you. That's the blessed hope. God would never do that to the bride. God would never beat up his bride. Well, no, God doesn't beat up his bride. Satan beats her up. My Lord, people, 10 of the 12 apostles died for their faith. So did Paul. The prophets died for their faith. A lot of people in the Bible, Stephen died for their faith. Christ died for us as an example. And people say, oh, well, we're the New Testament end time Christians. God would never do God would never allow us to die for our faith. He would never let us get beat up. Really? I hope you're right. I hope you're right. You know, I I, I would hate to be uh, 
destitute and, and well, let's take a look. One of the best chapters in the Bible is Hebrews chapter 11. It's the, uh, the faith chapter. I could read the whole thing, but, you know, I've already gone two hours. So let's just read Hebrews 11, verse 35. Women received their dead raised to life again. Who was that? Uh, Lazarus, right? And um, women received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Do you know that there's resurrections and then there's a better resurrection? What does that mean? You get angels' wings? I, I don't know. Not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had, tri a, had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings. That's getting whipped and beaten, people. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Verse 12, chapter 12. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Does that sound like the pre-trib rapture? People were sawn in half. They were stoned. They were imprisoned. They were beaten. They were killed with the sword of whom the world was not worthy. And Daniel was astonished at how evil the end time kingdom was going to be. And people, I think it's coming. So, all right, well, this is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Stick around for part two, people, please. In Jesus' precious name, amen.